Hello, hello. Welcome to the uh, Board Game Variety Hour, Board Game Design Variety Hour with your host, Matthew Dunstan. Uh, nice to see everybody. Some people already in the chat. Hey, Rob, Al, Alex, Fabio, and Uh Yes, there are all the important people here. Okay, we can go home now. We're, we're done. We've, we've done our, our, our meeting for the week. Hey, Bass and Bram. Like, yeah. Thanks for thanks for dropping by. How's everyone going? How 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 was your weekend? I was I I was a little disorganized. So I haven't quite adjusted my background. Yeah, that's probably my background, I guess, in inverted commas. Um, I I artfully display board game boxes to have something in the background, but also to hide a lot of crap on my table that uh, is still there. So <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't up with it. Uh, how things are going? Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, well, it's another Monday here in uh, in Prague, and you know, life life inside this uh, in this uh, house <laughs> that I you know uh, it seems to be spending all my time in. But uh, started with uh, yeah, Advent. I guess is a. I'm not sure if I really chatted about it on Friday or not. Um, you know, has anyone got some good Advent calendars going on? With uh, my actually probably my first time. Uh, uh, my partner bought me a kind of a, I don't know how to, it's like a designer fruits and raw chocolate bars and nuts and mueslis kind of advent calendar. Um, so you get a new like specialist muesli or porridge or, uh, you know, nuts or something each day. But I've never really had like a, a product-y kind of advent calendars. When we grew up, you just had little ones and you have a window that you would open uh, as, as you're going on. Alex says you wanted to get, a cheese advent calendar. I would, I would definitely support a cheese advent calendar. I'm not sure if anyone is saw <laughs> talking of cheese. Um, Bruno Catala. It's actually interesting from a game design point of view. Actually, maybe I'll try and find it. Um, Bruno Catala uh, released this kind of like Catala log, <laughs> um, which is uh, basically a catalog of all his games that I, I, I would guess that are on sale uh, now. Or you know, sort of like a Christmas gift guide, um, and yeah, I guess I was thinking of Christmas, and yeah, and I'll, I'll try and find the the part of it that reminded me of the cheese. But I have to find his. Uh... Oh, I don't know how to search Facebook very well. Let's see, uh, Bruno. Um, what else are the other people doing? Weekend was chilly. Yeah, it's but weirdly enough, so we had snow last week here, and then it was like thirteen degrees Celsius yesterday. It was like really warm. It was. It was bizarre. Uh, oh, nice to see you got some garden work done. So it couldn't have been too too uh, too bad. Not too much rain in in uh, England. Hopefully, I'll uh, order Evan Calder. It got substituted for five chocolate Santas. <laughs> that, that I guess that's kind of like efficiency, isn't it? It's like concentrating uh, everything into instead of you know like what is it like? So you five chocolates per day into into one set uh, Santa, I guess. Uh, Bass played a solo session of packs. Max Pimier, I guess, second edition. Yeah, I've, I've played it once. Uh, it was I, I quite enjoyed it. It was it was slightly overwhelming, in that, like the design, is is an interesting. There's lots of interesting things to think about, but for me, there was a lot of rules overhead, at least in the first game. Lots of little exceptions about how things interact, and maybe I, you know, maybe I'd do better if I'd read the rules first. Like I was taught it by someone else, but. Um, yeah, it's it, it was it was interesting, but and it's not inelegant in a way, but for some reason I just didn't grasp the rules very well, so it was a bit of a bit of a slog for me. But uh, yeah, uh, Alex five five wow, so near zero foggy around Brighton, no snow yet. Uh, Rob's been playing some Gloomhaven. Oh, okay, great. And and I did you play Jaws the Line without like have you played normal Gloomhaven before or? Is this your first first take? I, I quite like to see the Jaws of the Lion um, sort of package. I'm interested in the kind of these books, like also with the Hitman project and things like that. Seeing seeing what's going on. Uh, I should. I'm trying to find this Cathala log where he put it on Facebook somewhere. Don't don't look at Bruno Cathala's Facebook page if you want to if you want to not feel you know um, inadequate about your own designing output because you know I'm looking back within the last week he's put information about you know like three new games or something <laughs> so don't don't do that or and that's interspersed also with beautiful pictures of living in like the french alps so <laughs> it's uh no no but it's it, oh here we go here we go 
tell us where is the no. That's his. Okay, very interesting for everybody watching right now. But uh, I didn't want to show me trying to find it. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So he, he produced this. Uh, uh, where's my share? Yeah, he produced this catalog <laughs> uh, for Christmas 2020, um, and got this really cool artwork made. I guess it's the 12, 12 days of Cathala Christmas. Uh, but yeah, yeah, basically like a catalog of all the things you can buy and, and I guess, you know, recommendations what would be good. Um, but the really nice thing he did was um, for his co-designs, he always had like a little thing uh, with with the author. So this is Corentin Lebrat, Lebrat uh, is a French designer, part of uh, Team Kaidama. Uh, and there's, he co-designed this Trek 12, this roll and write, new roll and write game that I quite like to try actually. I'm not sure if anybody has seen it out there, but it, it seems like a quite cool roll and write. It's a little bit, reminds me maybe a little bit of, um, oh, like Can't Stop or something like that, where you roll two dice, but actually you get to choose how you're going to make the numbers relate to each other. Like sometimes you add them together or take the difference and you can do each operation a certain number of times of the game. So you're, you're trying to work out how best, how best to do it. But anyway, but the, the cheese point <laughs> going back a little while uh, was I'm way down here somewhere. Um, because uh, from Ice Team, which is a is a two player game that we designed together, um, and <laughs> Bruno chose to say cheese is life as my uh, as my you know uh, my what is it my reason for living or, or whatever. Uh, I, I don't really, I mean, my horrible friend. My first collaboration with Matthew, uh, we have a lot, I guess, a lot in common between science and dual science, and we also. Uh, you know, we, we like beautiful game mechanics and fr and cheese. <laughs> because for a little while, uh, I would always bring Bruno cheese at Essen as a, as a small little gift. I often would take these, those Lancashire cheddar uh, bombs, you know, um, they're like sort of they're cheese surrounded by black wax. And as far as I understand it, they're kind of non-perishable. So, you know, you didn't need to have them in a uh, refrigerated. So I'd always give him some cheese each, uh, each Essen. So I think he... He thinks that I, I mean, I really do like cheese, but uh, maybe not to the level that I would say cheese is life. But uh, anyway, so that's it. Yeah, but but as, um, yeah, Manuel, as you say, like it is a really cool, like I, like, I mean, I think Bruno for me always is a really great example of a designer, you know, like knowing what, what's important, like kind of branding yourself and, and getting promotion out there. And, and also I like that he's sort of not, at least my way of reading it is he, like there's no excuse like for example like i expect he's done this himself you know some of the graphic design is you know um a bit you can sell he sort of made it together what a program it is he's not a graphic designer um but it, you know he just does it anyway it doesn't he doesn't get in the way I, I can imagine that other other people might you know even myself you know like perfection is the enemy of done you might go oh I, you know i'd love to do that but i'd need to get a graphic designer or it wouldn't look very good and bruno's just like no i'm just going to do it I mean, obviously it helps that you have like 36 pages of games to show it probably doesn't matter too much about the graphic design, but yeah, and it is it is really nice that he, he co-designers, co -designs, yeah. I think, I mean, he's always, um, I'm not sure how well it's known in, in, I guess, the English speaking community, but he's actually very, like very supportive of new designers. Um, a lot of his games, you know, collaborations uh, are really with, you know, people he's just met and and who have a game and they sort of talk to him and, and he has some ideas and, and they work together. Um, it's very sort of open and free and he's not, you know, um, uh, like he doesn't look down his nose at anybody, you know, he's, he's happy to, to work with anybody. And, and yeah, he's really encouraging and, and like making sure that people get credit and, and things like that, so. Yeah, I have a lot of time for Bruno. But anyway, so that was the cheese part. But but yeah, I, I was thinking whether I would do something like this or or like maybe a short like, you know, buying games for Christmas guide for, for my games. I probably I should do. I probably won't get the uh, custom artwork uh, just yet. I mean, although some of these are like the the aspect of my nightmares, I imagine. But uh, yeah. anyway, I mean, I guess that's the games. Like, can you can you guess all of the games from the pictures? This is obviously five tribes. Um, I don't know what this one would be necessarily. He guys, there's a new cycling game here. Um, yeah. Anyway. So, uh, yeah. Um, but otherwise, what was I? Yeah, we were so, and, and like part of the thing that motivated, uh, today's stream well, a little bit was I got to play some, 
the octopus is for abyss. Yes, that's probably a good point. Yeah, <laughs> should, have, should have thought about that. Really, actually, I really, really like the abyss. I have a 100% success rate against Bruno playtesting expansions. So I, uh, <laughs> I, beginner's luck, I think. Um, the, uh, so yeah, on the weekend, I got to play a few new games, which are the ones behind me. Uh, Theory Trails and Glasgow, uh, which um, very kindly was sent to me by uh, Funforge, who, who I have a good relationship with, and they would do the French editions for, for these games. And it was interesting because I, I think in a different uh, setting, I'm not sure if it was on stream or, or in a different like mentoring thing, uh, I was talking a little bit about I don't like to review games or, you know, publicly. I mean, I don't review anyway. I wouldn't write a long review, but but even like short reviews or a tweet or something, I, I always find it a bit strange because, you know, both from the kind of like pragmatic point of view, like if I'm going to be working with a publisher, it probably doesn't make sense to, to slag off their games. I don't really want to lie. You know, I don't want to just say, oh, this game's fantastic if I didn't enjoy it. Um, and and also I think as a designer, I know what it's like to read, the, you know, like we all say, oh, you've got to have a tough skin and and you know you get more used to it as it goes on, but it it always hurts a little bit when you read something you know someone doesn't like your game and, and you know you accept it's of course not a personal thing, but um, especially with with people you respect or, or or that you really like, and you're just like oh it would have been great if if this person I really liked 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 my game. So I didn't want to be the person uh, you know putting out that that feeling for other people, I guess. But what I thought uh, I could do, which which might be interesting, would be to talk about what I think I liked. Uh, design-wise, or some design aspects in these games, and more just uh, unpicking a, a few sort of design aspects. But I should say I did actually enjoy both of these games uh, quite a bit, which probably helped me decide to actually do this. I'm not sure if I would would get up and go like, "Oh, this game was terrible," but but I, but I probably could could still do that. I don't know what other other designer what what you guys think about uh, what what you all think about uh, that that kind of policy. But um, yeah, it's a funny line to kind of have to have to to cross, I guess. Um, of course, there are people who are just radically honest in in the design community. I think of people like Bruno Fadudi, who will just say whatever he thinks. Um, but uh, and that's great. I, you know, I, I I think I really I love you know reviewers and people in the community who are, who give their honest and genuine feedback about things, and that's how games get better. But uh, yeah, Rob says Brett. Yes, that's true. He, he doesn't review very much, though. I guess, and he's not. Uh, yeah, he's completely off Twitter. I don't. Th I think he's sort of like off social media altogether. So I, yeah, I, I don't think he's. I, yeah, and he, in a way, he's also moving out and further away from the kind of hobby game space. But um, yeah, so I thought today uh, I'll chat about a few design things with these games. Um, I also, I mean, I don't have a lot of news because it was just Friday. Not a lot happened over the weekend. Uh, I was working. Uh, pretty much flat out doing the first part of the new adventure games, um, like Adventure Game 6, which will come out next year uh, in German, but I was doing the first draft, or like the first draft of the first part, and that took pretty much my whole weekend. Um, and I thought maybe I could chat a little bit about what I've termed um, working on creative projects productively, or productive creativity or something. Um, some, I don't know, I, I don't know the best way to do it, but I guess there are a few things I come by to help me get into the mode of when you have to work to a deadline and you have to be creative at the same time. Um, I find it quite difficult in a way because there's a bit of pressure, but also if you're trying to be creative, then, well, maybe ideas aren't going to come to you or maybe you're not going to come up with a good idea and, and what can you do to kind of get around that or to work through it or things like that. So um, so we could chat a little bit about that. Uh, and I also... Well, I'm not. I'm not sure. I was also thinking mini game jammy kind of feel. Maybe could be something I do on the stream a little bit. Um, I haven't looked at look. I haven't looked at Henry Audubon's uh, designer of parks and, and other things. I haven't looked at his Twitter feed for a while. He was tweeting these sort of visual game ideas, and I was thinking maybe I could sort of like on stream react to them and and you know just spit out ideas and and you know you can get a bit of an insight maybe how I, I look at new ideas or think about process um and there's a cool like board game idea generator that maybe we can have some fun with so yeah a uh, a veritable potpourri of, of game design things coming up today hey jay how you going thanks very much for, for popping by um yeah so well without further ado shall we do the uh the mini reviews um i should also say as always 
feel free to at any time drop questions in the chat or if you want me to talk about something you know i'm i'm but a mere puppet on stream to be uh tossed tossed uh, in the uh, to the whims of of, of things uh yes fast please do what please do what i can't i can't i can't act to that whim you know if you're just gonna say <laughs> hey theo how are you going welcome actually theo will be in here too sorry i should i'll, I'll bring theo let, uh, just earlier i was talking about the uh catalog um just a sec oh okay siri thinks i'm Stop talking it. to it i couldn't quite hear Stop. you Stop, Siri. Yep, you couldn't hear me. I'm not talking to you. Um, yeah, everyone should go and follow Theo, by the way. Uh, great designer. We work together. Great Twitch channel. Good way to improve your French as well. Uh, he he, uh, he uh, talks about game design uh, in French um, and has the most impeccable uh, fashion sense of any designer I know. Uh, maybe save Ryan and it's here, although, you know, nobody can be Reiner. Uh Rob's talking about can a review be unbiased when the designer is watching you live? That is true. I'm gonna have to. Yeah, I, 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 I did have in the back of my mind Mendel might be watching um, thing, but that's why I'm gonna say nice things about it. You know, it's a good thing I really liked it. But uh, you asked us if you should start with me. Oh, I see. Okay, I will start with me, Ruse. But um, Thea said he just lost two hours sending a prototype by Eve. I'm sorry. I'm. But is it successful in the end? I, I hope so. Um, anyway, sorry. Too many. And this is also, I'm not sure if anyone, I'm not saying anyone should have ever watched any interview I've given for game design, but when somebody gives me a question on these things and they let me free reign, I will, I, I just, you know, like I'll go on a thought and I'll, I'll go, oh, but now I can go over here. And, but my brain will remember you were over here. So at some indeterminate time, I'll go back to that. So I guess this stream is essentially me giving me license to talk on any change that I want. Follow Theo, uh, Theo, Sasha. Uh, underscore Sasha on Twitch, also great guy, great guy to support. Um, and I will show uh, Theo's uh, entry in the catalog. Um, and I guess Theo, uh, also Theo, congrats to Theo also, uh, just recently signed a new game with Bombix, uh, also a co-design with um, Bruno, uh, I think, if that's right. Check out, check out Facebook. Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. How far do I have to go down, Theo? Let's see. Um, da, 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 da. um, oh, I could have actually, if I, if we wanted to be doing reviews of, of designers who are watching the stream, I could actually also talk about, um, Nagaraja, which, um, Teresa and I got to the table not so long ago. Um, this is where I'm going to scroll past it without thinking what I'm doing. Uh, is it here? Have I gone past it? No. Let's see. No, that can't be right. Okay, we've got to look out for Nagaraja. I must have somehow gone past it without. It must be here. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Stop. A control plus fine. Well, that I'm not sure if we will find it. You just passed. Yeah. Here we go. So this is there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Skype, Zoom, Discord, all of the above or something. Uh, <laughs> that's I, I, Theo, you have to tell us why why is this the thing that Bruno most uh, associates with you? Um, Theo is inventive, don't know what that word, enthusiastic, excellent communicator, a talent, um, uh, something over a number of years. Um, Another, would you like? Oh yeah, you're just flexible. You're just a very flexible person to work with. What, what, what form would you? I mean, he didn't. Yeah, he did put Discord. So Theo and I, Theo and I work through Discord. Although we do talk over Skype or um, Facebook, even if we need to, uh, depending on you know which which technological platform is is working. Um, and this Nagaraja, which I um, two player game and could feature in a future mini review segment. Um, so. Yeah, I think what Bruno is meaning that there's just another, yeah, that, that you're very flexible. Okay, so I, I, am, I am correctly representing you. Good, good, good to know. Well, good luck with the, the, the parcels, I guess. Uh, anyway, but I'll start with, well, I'm, I'm here. Okay, well, this is, this is a bit of the board. But um, yeah, first up is uh, Fairy Trails, which is a new two-player game from Uwe Rosenberg. And it's really weird because, um, 
I, I, I have also another new Uwe Rosenberg game, this Robin of Loxley, which I haven't played, but I have read the rules. And when I read the rules, I was like, oh, this is kind of like a two-player version of like Ray Colt because it's another race and you have to, you know, you can spend resources to skip over spaces and there are different like requirements on, on, on that racetrack and things like that. And a lot of times you play his games and you're like, oh, I can see how that's like a mixture of, you know, X plus Y of his previous games or this is like the two-player version of the polyomino line or, or whatever. But to my knowledge, this is actually kind of completely new. And I don't think you would guess it to be an Uwe Rosenberg game. Um, so basically, you have uh, these cards, which is probably easier just to show on the screen. screen. Um, you have each card is essentially a square, and it shows both a pink and a yellow trail. And like one player is pink and another player is yellow. So like you can see an individual card is like, like this, for example. And Every path, like yellow, pink, yellow, and pink, always connects to each of the four four edges. So you'll never there's no like connectivity problem. You can like rotate things freely. It's a very very simple game. You 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 have two cards. Each turn you're going to play one, um, and it's a it's another race game, which is interesting. You have these little stones, and essentially all along the paths you have houses in a particular color, and um, what you're trying to do basically is make your colored paths terminate. So you'll have terminations, which are these kind of like kind of nodule kind of things. And once you have nodules on both ends of the path, then it's completed. And you can then place your, your stones on any houses that are along that terminated path in, in your color. Um, and that's basically the game, actually. That, that's the entirety of the game. And it's just a race to, to place all your stones. The first you place your stones. And then there's like a tiebreaker if you run out of cards, basically. But we got quite close to that in one of the games. But then the other couple, we've, we've never got close to that. And somebody won quite quickly. Um, and I think for me, uh, someone, oh, yes, the two can get. Yeah, yeah. So it's Over the Rainbow. Check out on Facebook. I could, well, this is why I also have a, a, you know, it's like, I can look up things on stream. I don't have to be pre-prepared. I can, I can show Theo's game, new game as well. Uh, oh, let's have a look for Theo. Da, 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 da. Where is your thing that was here? Da, 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 da. Uh, yeah, here we go. So this is this is Theo's new game that's just been signed with Bombix over the rainbow which I think is a pretty simple sort of set collection-y kind of fast hand management kind of game. Um, Theo saying, I have to answer all my mail on BGG. Did someone see how much? Oh, it's not that much mail. It's like 15 messages. Most of them are like super old and I don't know. I've, I, I think I've just forgotten to ever, like, I'm not sure if people have this with their, like their emails, they have this internal count and you're sort of like, there's nothing new. So you don't have to answer any old things. So for me, 15 is effectively zero on BGG. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, so so yeah, congratulations to you. <laughs> uh, Nicholas saying it's a group in the get rid of your stones thing that he's got going on Nova Luna. Also, Sagani, I actually don't, I haven't heard of Sagani, I haven't tried Nova Luna, but you have a good point about that. But I guess Nova Luna was then inspired by a different game, not not one of his own, right? One of like Koali's games. Um, but uh, oh, yes, also Tukan, yeah, I should have, yeah, there's also. Um, Theo's just signed, or, or they're, they've just released details of a new Helvet, Helvetique game. Um, so also huge congratulations there. Uh, but anyway, back to Fairy Charles. And I guess the thing I wanted to chat a bit, a little about was um, I love that it's one of these things where every time you play one of these cards, you're simultaneously trying to do something for yourself, and at the same time you have to think about how that card is going to help or hinder your opponent. And it's, it's um, you know, I talk about this like entangled decision making, you know, where you're trying to get two different concepts into one decision. And this is just another perfect example of it. You're playing one card and at the same time, that's furthering your own cause and also affecting what's happening to your other player. Because it might not be um, really evident from the very start, but one of the main tactics in this game is that um, for your opponent to uh, like to make it a lot harder for them is to keep branching their, their paths because you know, you can think of it, if I have a linear path that I just need to put an end on each end, I can effectively think I'm like two cards away or two nodes away from finishing that track and then getting my stones down. But if then an, if, if my opponent then puts a branch at one end, then it, effectively you've made two more termini. So instead of just having two, now I have three. So I'm like three cards away. So I'm getting further and further away. 
And sometimes it can completely spiral out of control, you know, if a, because there are cards here which are like four complete four-way connections. Um, so, you, you know, if you add one of those at the end, you've just added, you know, where there was one, now there are three termini to have to try and, try and finish. Um, and so a lot of the tactics strategy is to try and finish your own while at the same time branching your opponent's paths. And of course, there's like some clever little things on the design, like, you know, the houses are not on every card and you not, all, not every card has a house of each color. But of course, the harder cards, the, the more branches tend to have a house. So, you know, if you want to score with the houses, then you need to have, you know, you're making it harder for yourself to finish off the, tra the trails. Um, yeah, and I think I think for me that would I I just loved this um, again just really simple and also there's there's kind of no rules in that there's no rules about every card can be placed everywhere as long as it's next to something you never there's never anything wrong so it, it you know it's completely so easy to get into um, and it it's just it, it it emerges you have all these little it, it's it's almost like a like an abstract like battle game because you have little battles going on. Um, you know, something like through the desert, like in through the desert, you're placing your camels and, and, and like little, little battles will pop up all across the board as players will sort of interact with each other. Like if I put a few camels over here, then you say like, do I need to react to that? Or will I keep trying to do the thing I was doing over here? And this is the same game because I might be working on a path in some part of the board, really trying to finish it. So I'm playing a lot of cards there. And then I, then I see what you're doing is like, do I put a card over there to try and interrupt you? Are you going to interrupt me? And as the game goes on, you resolve little battles when I finish a trail and then, then your attention moves on, on elsewhere. You know, for such a simple rule set, um, really, really fantastic game, actually. The only little downside I would say is that the colors are a little bit hard. Like, I wish they had chosen two better colors. I, I mean, maybe for color, colorblind, it, it works quite well. Um, but like the yellow and pink, we were playing in a bit of low light one of, one of the days and that was a bit tricky. Um, so that that's really the only thing. Like, so I think for for like the ease of design, like the race is really nice. Um, you get an amazing feeling when you finish a big network that you've been really working on. So it, it really has. It just that does that like tension really well, where you, you're. It's like just one another turn, just another turn. I need to play one more card. I need to play only two more cards. Then I've finished it all. Uh, and when you get to do that, despite you know the maybe the your opponent getting in your face. Uh, it just feels really great. And, and again, it packs all that into like 15 minutes or something, 15, 20 minutes. Um, the other thing is like, uh, you know, it's it's just a deck of cards, super simple to travel with, super simple to set up. Um, you know, you just shuffle up the cards and, and go again. So it's just, um, you know, I think like I'm, I'm really quite amazed by the design thing. And I think more and more it makes me personally um, want to think about... Uh, wants me to think about race games again, because I think Uwe is kind of bringing them back. Um, if anyone knows any other people, any other kind of like more, more modern race, Euro race games, um, put them in the chat. It would be interesting to, to, to think of or chat about them, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, because it's an interesting, I mean, in, in two players, it, it works quite well. And it's, it's not that different, I guess, from points because someone's always going to win. But, uh, you know, I haven't played Raycold actually, I, so I don't know how that race dynamic works in a multiplayer setting as, as much. Um, but uh, it works really well here. So uh, yeah, it, and I haven't heard it being talked about very much. I think it's from a new, a relatively new publisher, Paper Plane Games. Um, so yeah, if, if you like kind of two-player games, uh, you know, with a really, um, you know, fast kind of, just yeah, fast, easy to play, lots of really great tension, you know, Really nice feeling. So, yeah, that was that. Uh, Rasmus, there is a new through the desert which handles the color issues, I believe. Oh yeah, I don't know which point you came in the conversation, but I was talking about this fairy trails game, which I was likening a bit to through the desert with the way, like, you have this sort of little mini mini battles, and I was talking about the color issues in this. Well, they're not really issues, but it's just a little bit hard. Um, I I suspect the new, yeah, I guess the probably yeah, because Fantasy Flight re-released it, right? I presume they would have thought about the, the color issues. Um, Nicola, about the Koali game predecessor Nova Luna, um, yeah, there were some, some... Yeah, I mean, he put it in the rules, right, where he said that he'd played the game and it had directly inspired this game and, and it ended up being sort of a co-design um, that they were, they were talking about, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's that. He nervously thinks about as, as Mandela's in the chat and I have to, I have to say something. No, I don't have to say something else, I'm sure. I'm sure our... our um, 
you know, our working relationship will not be tarnished by anything I say about uh, Glasgow, which is the other one I wanted to quickly chat about. Um, interesting enough, because uh, uh, it, it features a mechanism that I myself have also used in one of my games. Um, so um, I, well, I don't know. I was looking for, I mean, this is probably the easy first thing to start with is like on the back, back of the box is a good way to kind of show the, the setup. You have this ring of essentially action tiles with different actions on them, and then you're going to be building a city, uh, both of you competitively, amongst that. It's going to be a four by five grid of these square building tiles. Um, and the main mechanism is you each have a, have a person on, on these action track, and basically you're going clockwise, and on your turn you go as far as you want clockwise uh, until you go where you want to take the action. Um, and the trick is it's like Thebes or these kind of time travel, uh, not time travel, time track mechanisms in that whoever's behind just gets to keep taking turns until they overtake the other player and then the other player gets to go. Um, so I have a, a, another nice kind of picture over here, I guess. Um, I, was, <laughs> and I said, feel free to be honest to anything that was, wasn't to your taste. Yeah, instead of like a spoiler alert, I'll say, you know, negativity alert, no. But I actually, I don't think I have too many uh you know we're, we've only played it a few times but um i was for me actually interesting thing, so i i designed a game called raids with the yellow or with brett gilbert and um it was a uh it has this same mechanism where you can move as far as far as you want on your turn and of course whoever's behind gets to take the next turn it's a little bit different in that you can fight over tiles you can land on the same space as someone else here you can't land where anyone else was and in that also, you only take the action <clears throat> if nobody's fought you. So you kind of take it at the start of your turn and then move off the tile, whereas here you, you land on the tile, do the thing immediately. And actually, it's interesting because it, I, I, when I played the game, um, it, it kind of answered or showed me a way to do what we had tried to do. One of the problems we had with raids, um, not really a problem, but, but the thing that uh, some players didn't like very much in the game was that there were points later on in the rounds in the game where, you know, if you weren't that interested in certain tiles, you, you would just go a really far way around the track. Um, we had a few things, like there were a few tiles that you couldn't land on, and when you were the first part of, past, like the first player past a certain tile would, like, grab something from it. So there was a bit of an incentive to go ahead in that way. But what it led sometimes was that it was just too good to be the first player. You'd go a really far away. And... The flip side of it also was that it's also with these games, and like Takedo is maybe a, a very good example of this. In Takedo, when I play Takedo, I, I always find it a bit hard to justify skipping ahead that far because all the actions are kind of good. They all give you points. And on average, if I'm giving you two actions to my one action, it's, it's quite hard to make that up, especially because a lot of the things are kind of like set collection -y things. And so, even if I'm taking something that's good for my set, I'm kind of letting you work on maybe two sets at the same time, like in the best instance. So, and you're going to be more flexible in the future. Now, of course, Takata is a multiplayer game, so it's not as cutthroat. But yeah, there's always this thing that I know there are certainly times where you want to go a bit further, but Takata would always feel so strongly thing that like just taking more actions is better. But in this game, and, and it was interesting, when you, when you sit down, it, it just emerges from playing the game that I felt like it's the cleanest, like, beautiful balance of uh, that, that tension to take more action versus taking the action you want. So, like, how far do you want to move ahead? And, it, and I guess, like, from, from what my feeling is, it's because the game is really all around, you need to build the buildings, and buildings have a cost, which is all visible. It's all, you know, everyone knows what the cost of these buildings are. Resources are relatively tight, and the actions offering giving you resources. And because you can so clearly see what, and, and because it's a two-player game as well, you can really clearly see what your opponent is able to do. So if you're heading up, there are like the building spots are interspersed around the ring. Uh, like this is one of the building spots, and it'll have a couple of tiles next to it, so they're like two tiles at each building spot. And so you'll see, you know, you'll both be heading up to this next building spot, and you can see very clearly, like, Maybe your opponent can't build anything there, or maybe they can build something, but they will need to take a particular action on the way, um, and they can see the same thing about you. And because that's it's such open information, it gives you a lot of room for sort of tactical play, because you can essentially go, well, okay, I know my opponent needs a gold before they get to that building, 
So I can make sure because they know that they don't want me to take the goal. What I might do is I'm just going to go very slowly and that might encourage them to go, you know, really all the way to the goal straight away. And then I'll get a few more actions for free. Or do I want to take that goal off them and make it more difficult to them? But of course, then I'm giving up actions. Um, maybe I'm not describing it very well, but but it, but essentially, like if, if you ever played any of these games, like I think Takato for me is, is the kind of, um, or Glenn Moore is another example. It, I feel like this game is the best evolution in that tension between moving far forward to get the action you want and just taking more actions. And it's because you have such clear expectations of what you need to do. So because you're limited and, you know, like the game will end when 20 buildings are built. So if I build more buildings, that's usually better. So it's not like, you know, if you have lots and lots of the resources, it doesn't mean that you'll be able to use them the best. Um, and it, it becomes very... Yeah, and that and and the other really nice thing is that comes out more and more as you play the game because you start to know, okay, where you know where can I take those little risks? And it's a game full of these little tactical decisions um, where you're like, how can I squeeze out that little extra action over my opponent? How can I get that one extra thing? Or how can I kind of make them pay an extra thing? And and in a way, that's what we were trying to do with raids. In raids, um, you, you know, you can land on a space that somebody already was on and you would have a little fight. You know, you would, it was almost a bidding mechanism. I'd have to pay one Viking to land on the same space. You could fight me back and pay two Vikings. I'd have to fight back and pay three. And whoever couldn't pay would have to keep moving on. So it was all about, in that game, it was about these like mini decisions. Can I land somewhere and try and put someone on a space that somebody wants? Maybe I can make them pay one Viking to attack me. And I, I didn't really care about the thing, but I've, I've made them, you know, pay a little bit more for it. And, and this has a, a similar feeling that, um, you're making all these little, uh, you know, like like micro evaluations about, um, you know, how far to go, how many actions to give up. But it's it's balanced enough that either way can be the right way to go. It's if you play the game where you just auto go, I'm going to just take the next action available. I'm just going to like leap probably probably You you probably won't win the game um, because there are clear points where you can you can eke out a little bit more from the other players. And you know these are put out variably, so it has a really nice. But like, I like that the variability actually is packed into where the really interesting decisions are, because the order in which those those actions have come out um, is very important, and it changes that decision tree a little bit. If you have a lot of like one resource next to each other, then not only um, do you know you'll probably share out that resource a lot, but it means that it won't be available in other places of the track. So you, you know there are points where you're probably going to slow down and like sort of go one over each other because you all need that resource. But if they're evenly dispersed, then you can even try and cut someone else out, out of a resource. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I don't know what else to uh, say in terms of the design thing or the things that kind of triggered in my mind. But I think if you're like as a really interesting implementation of the time track mechanism, a really clean mechanism, and, and maybe also I think it has... It, it makes perfect sense in a two-player game in this sense because you can so accurately sort of work out what your opponent can do and then you can make a decision based on that sort of mess around with them. I don't think it would be as possible um, or it wouldn't have this sort of fine balance in, in multiplayer. So so very, very impressive. I must say, uh, Mandela, we've, we've, not, we, we've always had all the train stations come out and that seems to have been where all our fighting is. At. I, I imagine that, uh, that if there are fewer train stations that come out, that maybe it's... It's interesting, well, because the the other variability is that you have I don't know how how many building tiles there's there's many more than you use probably double I guess maybe there's forty four or something, and you'll build twenty essentially. But even just that mix of tiles that come out of those opportunities mean there are kind of different set collecting kind of um, opportunities in the game, which is which is also will mean the game will play out differently. And even the order in which they come out, you know, if if certain opportunities are the ones that are present earlier are the ones that are going to have a bigger effect if there are a lot of parks early on. Parks score essentially it's square. Like you, if you have three parks, it's nine points. So if a lot of them come out early, then the game sort of comes about parks because, and everyone's looking for the parks. And you even have actions which can re, you know, essentially bring out new buildings, to help you dig for the thing you need. Um, so it's not just about even just the mix of tiles, but it's even the order in which they come out because new ones are revealed as you go on. So yeah, I, I think it was really interesting. I, I, from a designer point of view, I'd say definitely check it out. And it's one of those things, um, you know, I think in both of these games, I guess the thing that uh, stood out for me is I think 
what I liked about the games, you wouldn't really be able to tell from the reading the rules again. And I, for me, that's like one of the great things about games and, and why, why you play. You know, I wouldn't know this feeling with the, the time track kind of thing. And I wouldn't know the feeling of that, the kind of tactics of trying to make sure your opponent's networks never finish. It's, it's you know, it's hard to kind of think how that works until you play it. And it's actually quite a new feeling. I, I, haven't, I haven't played the games that do that. So I love games that surprise you when you play them. And, and you're like, oh, wow, yeah, there is something really interesting here. And, and it is a surprise because you didn't see it in the rules. Or, you know, rules can't contain that, that interaction or that um, interest, I guess. Uh, yeah, so there you go. You can, you can, you can open your ears now. Uh, I've, I've stopped. I've stopped saying all the negative stuff, Mendel. So <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, uh, yeah, everything's fine. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. I think you should you should definitely play it there. Yeah, I I mean I think I I would agree uh, that um, you know like I'm not sure when you look like walk past the shelf. You know, again, it's it's a lookout two player game. You know, it's uh, it. You know, it doesn't scream excitement, but um, I think it that that like that tension and that balance is really nice. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, so that's that's it for the mini reviews. <laughs> we'll we'll see see if they return. Um, yeah. Again, it, it's sort of a funny thing. I I would prefer to, I guess, and uh, you know, everyone, you always want to talk about things that are that have had an impact, that like a interesting impact on you. Um, rather than talking about things that didn't work. And the other thing I'm, I'm a bit, um, I mean, which I didn't talk about, but I, I could talk about it in, a, in a, you know, in an interesting way. If I was being a bit knee jerky, you know, in, in our, uh, we played, uh, no, we played three games now. They've, they're, this train station, which I've talked about, it's this kind of set collection you're building. If you have four different, these four different types, you get 10 points. And there are three of them in the game. and. If you have that set, one of each of these four types, they can count towards multiple train stations. You don't need two of each time. And they're worth 10 points, which is a lot in a game that's like uh, scores around like 40 to 50, or at least those have been our, our scores, like a winning scores around 50, 52. Um, and in our games, they've pretty much always the trains have, like the winner has always had two, like two or even three of the train stations. And a lot of the, like in the first game, I got want because I kind of didn't, Grok the, the train station thing. And the next two games, we were very aware of it. And they also all came out early. And what I said about this thing where I suspect, you know, depending on what comes out early, that, that flavors the game. You know, obviously you can play a game where none of the train stations have come out, or if only one train station comes out. I think if, if you have one train station, there's a cost. You have to kind of get these four different types. It's not that efficient because you've got to like, for example, a park is one of these things you have to have as part of the train station. A single park's worth a point. It's not that great. So the real, you know, the real kind of benefit of like where you, you know, when I think about set collection or when I design set collection, you always sort of think about what's my average case. And that's like what I should say is the par score, you know? So, um, you know, if in, in an average case, I should value the tile or whatever the average case is. And then I should think of a way that the player can do better than the average case. And that's how they win the game because they have enough of these things that are kind of like doing better than the average rate. So, you know, from what I can think of with the train stations and Mandela should jump in if, if there's a different thinking. My, the way I would conceive it of is that, you know, if you have one set of the things, and you have one train station, you get 10 points. It's a good 10 points, but you've also had to build four other things, which is quite difficult. Some of those things might not be worth many points. So that's kind of how it's balanced. If you then build a second train station, you don't have to do any of that anymore because you've already fulfilled all the requirements. So that's, that's where you get over the, the going rate. Um, and I think, you know, there, for us, it, it just worked out that, you know, we all fought over the train stations, but somebody's going to get them. And once someone got two, that was that was quite a bit of a point. So it was funny because I, around this time, uh, Elizabeth Hargrave, Hargrave tweeted something about, you know, uh, you know, she loves it when people get back in touch and say, oh, we'd like to play with this house rule after playing with it once or this thing's unbalanced or, or whatever. And it's interesting. We're, I'm a human being. Like when I finished the game, I was like, "Oh, train stations! Those seem like amazing. Like, how can we ever play?" It? But uh, you know, I know that I want to play it more because I I know that I you know I trust Mandela. I also trust Lookout. That it's it's not that case. Um, but it's interesting to try and unpack that and you know what can and obviously the the random deal of tiles and and there's a little bit of luck in how buildings come out. But of course, that's kind of the fun of it. 
Um, I should also say the other thing is it's also really quick. It is like 20 minutes once you get going. Um, and it has a really great, like, a little rate. Like, there's this weird point where the, you kind of like, oh, I can build my engine and I can build all these things. And you're like, wow, there's only five spaces left that you can build in. Wow, we're only going to be building like two things each. Okay, then it's this like real race to the finish, um, which is which is really interesting. So, uh, yeah. And Theo said, uh, Muscovius, you missed it because of the look. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's that's true. I mean, the French, you know, they're they're you, you know, this is the, the the difference in. Well, actually, no, this isn't a French. Oh, well, this is actually a French Canadian company, I think. Well, they're from Montreal. It says, but um, no, they're of course a, a sort of different uh, different. Um, approaches to to presentation. I mean, look, look out knows their audience, right? And I'm sure anyone who likes the two player games will go. Uh, it's comforted by that familiarity. But so, uh, yeah. Uh, first impressions are so important in set collection games. I introduce she to go to a group of friends who, after the first game, always refer it to the pudding game. I refer it to it as the sashimi game because it's. It, I mean that that is sort of it's fun because you, you know, for me it's a sashimi is this this. That's the core fun bit of the tension. It's like, is this the round I'm gonna first pick a sashimi knowing nothing, especially in like a five or six player game. And after everyone flips that first card, you either know it was amazing and you see the second hand uh, where like either, and it's just so, you know, it's this, it's just, it's just pure pushy luck basically, I, I think, which is, which is quite fun. Um, Josh just was saying a small thing that caught my eye was the way you keep track of who owns what by building tiles point Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't. I didn't show that. Um, maybe there's a better picture of it actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like. Yeah, you can see basically that as you build the grid, you just have the little arrow points towards the player who owns it. So there are no like ownership markers or anything like that. Um, which yeah is, is a really neat kind of like ergonomic kind of trick with the game. Uh, yeah, I think the other thing is it does a lot with not you know like it gives a very like crunchy Euroy kind of feel. In like twenty minutes, with not many components, um, which is which is quite, which is really great. Uh, can can people hear me or not? Have I? Okay, am I back? I hope I'm back. Uh, great, great, I'm back. Fantastic. Yeah, sometimes, uh, yeah, StreamYard just has has an issue, I guess. But uh, yeah, thanks very much, everyone. Um, yeah, so yeah, it does it does a lot with with not much. So um, yeah, very cool, very cool. Well, the mini reviews went a bit longer than I thought thought they would, but uh, yeah, it's a, it, but it was it was a really nice sort of uh, yeah, just nice when you discover things things you enjoy. So yeah, I, I was I was pleasantly pleasantly surprised. I mean, not not huge super surprised, um, but uh, yeah, yeah, you know, it, it was good. Uh, I'll have a quick cup of tea. Uh, um. So, uh, any any comments, questions about about the games? But yeah, would would recommend. Um, uh, I guess the only yeah, well, not the only other. <laughs> um, you were sort of thinking about talking about pr productive creativity, just as a bit of a, uh, a more relaxed, chill, you know, uh, discussion as much as it can be via stream, but. Uh, no, I was just I was thinking as I was slaving away at, at these adventure games over the weekend, um, I have to come up with so many tricks to get to get me as a person to work on these things. You know, I, like like everyone, you always work straight up to the deadline. You don't do anything. You know, you could just work a little bit as you go along, but of course you leave it right till the end. But you know, when you're trying to come up with you know a narrative game and puzzles with a narrative game, you can't. <sighs> It's not something where I, you know, it, time put in equals result, right? You know, because I could spend a lot of time trying to think of a puzzle, and not, nothing comes to me. And I was thinking a lot about, uh, sort of reflecting on on the various tips and, well, not tips, tricks I use for myself. Um, and maybe these would be useful for for designers. Uh, but if if anyone listening has things they do, 
uh, I'd be super, super interested to, to hear about them. Um, and for me, actually, it, it, it really comes down, one of the things I really thought about, well, I have, I have a little, little, I even prepared a little list so that my thoughts will be somewhat structured. But the first thing was that um, little mini goals. People talk about goals a lot and they are important, of course. Uh, but for me, again, like breaking down things into, not even just breaking a bigger problem down into small chunks, but also uh, they're not only a way of like compartmentalizing, but they're also a way of giving you a much more reachable like milestone that you can feel like you've got something done, which for me is very important because if I don't feel like I'm making much momentum, you know, if I don't get into it in the first five or 10 minutes, then I won't do anything for three hours or something, which is, is not very useful. Um, and it's a lot easier, more easy to trick myself into going, oh, okay, but you only need to get, you know, these five things done rather than the 50 that I'm going to eventually have to get done. Um, so for like the adventure games, um, you have essentially points of interest on location. So each location is like a big location card and you might have like five to eight points of interest on the card. And I knew I had seven locations that I essentially had to fill with points of interest. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to get through five points of interest, no matter where they are, they could be on any location each time I sit down. Um, and that really helped. Like, I wish I had done that a lot earlier because I only did that about Sunday morning. I didn't do it on Saturday. And even the moment I did that, like maybe there's also like a mathematical bit of my brain that you can start, you know, it's quantifiable. You can sort of cross, start crossing things off. Um, when I used to, uh, I still do actually, I kind of edit, edit theses for members of my research group. Uh, I help by editing and proofreading. And, you know, when you get like a 150 page document, um, even though, you know, I'm not necessarily doing a lot of work on each page, you've still got to go through the whole thing. You've got to read it, um, read it sort of in depth. Often I'll like write, I'll literally have a number for each page, like one, two, three, four, five, on a, just a bit of scrap paper. And each time I get through one page, I'll just cross it off because that just feels, <laughs> I need that to kind of feel like I'm making any progress in this sort of like monolithic task of this huge thesis. Um, so yeah, like definitely making the little goals really helps a lot. Theo, Theo says, 2020 is peculiar in terms of productivity. I need to be in a very special state of mind to have some idea. If anything takes so much space in my mind, like a pandemic, it's hard for me to create creative. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I guess maybe the end, maybe the final stream of, this year maybe i'll do like a retrospective or something of 2020 uh from from a game designer point of view but yeah it is right i think for me that i i agree i think this has always been the case like i definitely go through periods of time where i have very few new ideas and i won't even be putting new ideas in in my notebook or you know like i thought at times that like oh i'm always having new ideas i'm always writing things. like i won't often be looking back on them because you know, I'll have a new idea and I then won't think about it again, you know, because I was like, well, that didn't work or it didn't catch me or, but at least I, I, I was sort of comfortable thinking, oh, but I have lots of ideas, even, you know, even if I don't need them. But no, it's not always true. Sometimes, you know, I don't add anything to my notebook for a week or two weeks or three weeks. Um, and in terms of those really not great ideas, but ideas that I can sink my teeth into and I can feel like I can really work on and like, oh, that seems cool. Um, they are much more often to come kind of close to each other, you know, like, you know, as we said, like, there's the phrase, like, you know, the, you know, but well, in Australia, we have a phrase about buses, you know, like, uh, buses, you know, you won't get any buses come for 20 minutes, and then three come together. Uh, and ideas uh, do feel like that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what it is, I guess. Yeah, you're right. Maybe if you're in the right state of mind, then everything kind of flows. Um, maybe it's just the structure of your day, or, or like what the things you've had to be doing um so yeah it's 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 um it's it's hard to quantify and i just try and make the most of it and and i i try to be to give my permission give myself permission to not worry about those times of not being creative because there will be times where i will be and i will have ideas um, yeah rob my I, my issue has been more with progressing ideas from the initial concept this year i've been doing more collaboration though which seems help i mean yeah this is i think i would not I would not be able to finish games. I, I can finish games that are solo designs, and I and I have, but I wouldn't be able to do that if I hadn't learnt that act of finishing in collaboration. For for me, um, you know, collaborating with designers very early on in my design career meant that I learnt that skill. Um, I don't think I would be able to do it 
had I always been working by myself, or at least it would be much more difficult. And I agree, it's really, um, I think now I feel like the bigger pressure for me is is not like, I know how to progress an idea, it's just actually time, it's just about balancing which thing I'm gonna push. And um, it is often that like the, you know, it's like the second and the third prototype, that kind of stage, like where you know what you have to do, uh, or you know something's not working, you need to try something, but it all feels like work because the game isn't really fun yet. Um, yeah, that, that's that's definitely something that, and I have a, you know, and, um, you know, Mendel and Theo are both here. Oh, I seem to have, once again, I don't know what's going on. Hopefully I'm back. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, my computer doesn't always do this. It's sort of strange. It only comes like once every five or six streams. It seems to have this weird issue where it just keeps losing it. Maybe the internet's not great or, or something like that. Sorry for the for it uh, being interrupted. But thankfully, actually, it somehow saves it with it. You can just refresh um, StreamYard and it's OK. So fantastic. But uh, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's tricky, and and yeah, Mandela and Theo would both know that uh, we both we both separately have ideas that are still at that kind of like second, third prototype stage, or even kind of first. And it's just for me, it's it's getting enough time amongst everything else um, to to move, you know, push push those things forward. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So set mini goals was was good for me. Uh, I have a big thing to say: step away from the computer. Uh, and and this is kind of for me, I know that I, I think better, I definitely think better in terms of creative or like a problem solving way when I'm not in front of the computer, especially if the work, because the work often like to move forward, you have to be typing something or you need to be manipulating a file. But that is not generally how I think of really new ideas. If I'm kind of in the flow and working on something that that they can work, but if I'm really stuck or if I'm not feeling it, I'm not going to find it <laughs> while I'm at the computer. Um, so yeah, I, I will go for a walk. I mean, that's why I kind of hate winter because you that, that you know like I don't really like walking when it's dark and cold. So it sort of shrinks the available amount of time you have each day to make make advantage like make advantage of that. And almost anywhere I've lived in my whole life, there's always been some like I and it's weird. I don't need variety in my walk. I will just do the same walk every time. The exact way I'm like crossing the roads and you know and like this might be like an hour walk or something just around the neighborhood but for me it's like muscle me you know I need I need something like very muscle memory that I'm like a physical activity that I'm not thinking about consciously and that lets my brain then start you know think creatively um for me my parents always joked we grew up with a trampoline in the backyard and I would often go there like before school and after school and it was just where I went to think because again it was just some regular you know, repetitive physical activity that kind of some you know freed up space you know for me to think about things create creatively or solve problems. Um, so yeah, it's it's again tricky with the pandemic and with winter in Europe. Um, but yeah, like and for me now, what I do is is you know I, I'm lucky enough I have kind of this mezzanine level up here and, and a lower floor down there, and I'll just go down to the lower floor and just kind of like walk around if if, if I don't feel like going outside, and that has even helped a little bit. Um, I do have to like tension a little bit, especially when I have a, when I do really have a pressure in time pressure. I like, I know I have to kind of work on something, you know, productively through the day. I'll set like a little timer. I'll, like we have Alexa, uh, not Alexa, Google, like Google Home. And I'll just set like a 10 minute timer when I go off to like have a break. So I know that like, and I sort of go like, oh, 10 minutes should be good. At least that will kind of like bring me out of it because also I can get too easily stuck in just thinking and thoughts and, you don't want to go back to the computer, but at least if you set the timer, it's it's sort of you know that you said, okay, I'm giving myself ten minutes, um, and once I've had those ten minutes, then I, I really should come back and and you know have another go at it, um, which is yeah, which is very useful anyway. Alex has a long list of actual things for his games, um, but getting some headspace to do them without a project deadline has been a struggle. Yeah, and that that's the kind of flip side, isn't it? When you if you obviously it's difficult to be productive to a deadline, but it's also difficult to be productive without any deadline at all. Um, yeah, I think, and that's also been the, tri the tricky thing with, um, you know, playtesting schedules and conventions also being disrupted. 
uh, some of those deadlines have also disappeared. Like, and it's probably a reason I haven't finished as many games this year because Essen wasn't coming up. For me, Essen is always this thing that has pushed me to make sure I, I know I always want four, usually at least four new games to show to publishers at Essen. So that pushes me the months before Essen to really finish things. But but I didn't have that this year. I didn't I didn't have that same push to for meetings and things like that. So I didn't finish as many games. Um, and I know you know so that's yeah and. And the same with, you know, we always had a weekly play test. So you knew you wanted to get a, a new places. You know, the thing I'd say to that is to, yeah, to find, for me, it needs to be some artificial way that's setting up those deadlines. I don't know if I'm very good at setting them myself when they're not real. Um, so yeah, if, if there's any way to find like a virtual play testing group or anything like that, where they, they meet regularly and you can really think that that can really help to push you to, to move ahead on the game um, because you always think, well, I should make the most of this playtesting opportunity, but if I haven't done anything to improve the game, well, that's a bit of a waste. Um, or even just setting, you know, I mean, these, you know, finding someone else to talk to and, and to be accountable to is also another thing, even if they're not a co-designer. If you have someone to chat to about a particular game that can kind of remind you, or how this, how is this game going? Or maybe they can have an, you know, you can kind of even map out where, where would you want to be in a, in a month or, or several months with, with a game. Um, yeah, I, maybe that could help. Um, yeah, at the, <laughs> you'll not anyone who's watched the stream will laugh that the last co thing I said is to finish a complete thought before moving on to the next, which is not something I practice in my streams, <laughs> obviously. But a um, yeah, I mean, with this, it's it's actually a little bit particularly with the adventure games because you always have these little narrative strands. It's a very open game where you have lots of little strands and they sometimes interweave and sometimes they're separate. And I think it was breaking things off into separate strands, but also making sure that once I'm in a strand that I finish it. For me, sometimes there's still the, the like the thing of like, oh, I've done five cards. Okay, well done, Matt. Now now take a break, have a cup of tea, whatever. But it, it's also really like when you're in the middle of it to try and finish that kind of unit of work. So if I'm you know, if I'm making a deck of cards, just try and do it all at the same time. Like if you've made 20, well, you're into it, try and just make the next 20 and finish it off. Um, because you're, yeah, you're just already in that mode of, and you have all the kind of parameters in your head and um, it's best to finish that complete thought while you're there and to push through that little barrier that might go, well, at least the barrier for me is always, oh, you've done 20 minutes, now you can have 20 minutes off. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not really someone who's ever been able to sit down and just work like hours on end on something. Any, you know, my I wrote my thesis for my PhD by just writing half an hour every day, but that was it. You know, I'd sit down half an hour every morning and I'd do the next bit. I mean, I had to do extra things, you know, you do analysis and things, but the kind of the pure writing, I just broke it up and because I, I couldn't be the person who would do like three weeks of writing at the end, like nonstop. I just can't, I can't work like that. Um, and you said one thing that really helps me are constraints. Uh, competitions are great for as well. Yeah, I guess for, for deadlines and things like that. Yeah, I think I was, yeah, I was um, recommending some design competitions to somebody else another day uh, recently. Um, I just saw the Cardboard Edison result or like contest results, for example. So that's a really good competition to check out. Um, there's the Hippo Dice competition in Germany and in Europe. Um, if you just Google board game design competitions, uh, you know, that, that also is, can be a really good, um, uh, it could be a really good impetus to finish a game. And, and also it's a relatively, in a way it kind of forces you, especially when you're starting with things, it forces you to do the task you're gonna need to do, like write rules, make a prototype, which is kind of like readable and clear. It sort of forces you to take these steps you need to do to finish a game. And, and once you've done those, actually, the, like, the cost to enter is, is relatively low. Like a lot of these games, you just email the rules out, or, or now there's like Tabletop Simulator or something. Um, I think that's, it, it, it both pushes you to do the things you need to do, but then the actual effort to enter is, is usually not too bad. So um, yeah, I find the, the, um, the competition is really useful for that. Um, yeah, and Rob says, if you want exercises, board game eyes as well. You're, you're reading my mind, uh, Rob, because the like the thing which I was wondering uh, about doing today was um, I have it even as a tab. The board game eyes are already here. I was thinking like we could do a kind of like a um, yeah mini game jam or something every every now and then where I just sort of ponder some idea or, or something like that. But uh, you know, it's uh, maybe we might at the end for a little bit of fun. Uh, hey, Bez, welcome, welcome. Nice, nice to see you. Um, 
<laughs> Manuel says, can I make a miniatures game without miniatures, a game that you can play without a table? That's an interesting idea. I, I remember there was, a, there was definitely a stage where I was thinking, it was like thinking about games that like fundamentally question, uh, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Alex is saying like a game with no pieces. It's like, what's like a, a genuinely thing that we think that always is in a game, like a game where you don't shuffle the cards ever, or, you know, a game where every card is, is face up or, you know, where you can look in the bag when you draw something out. Like it, it was always, it was a fun kind of exercise to go like, how do you question one of these like, um, you know, like game design truisms or something like that. Um, it was always a really kind of fruitful way to think uh, in certain ways. <laughs> Just got trick taking Spartan and space warfare, beat the game, can be played with grandma. Um, yeah, Jay, th this is it, board game Isa. Yeah, it's uh, it's what you've written, but without the e. Uh, so it's like board gam Isa. Um, yeah, thanks, Rob. Yep, Rob's put up the the link here. Um, yeah, so right now, for example, I've got area control, negotiate. Whoops, um, area control, negotiation, variable phase order, with royalty and the first to win a number of rounds. And you can also optionally add constraints, which I'll try and look at. So I could have a constraint, must be hard for the prey. <laughs> That's an interesting um, thing. <coughs> and then you can just keep like re-rolling until you get something kind of cool. Um, root building, diplomacy, French Revolution, Sultan. Interesting. And then constraints, plays under 15 minutes. Maybe maybe a new, um, something like Rob, Rob Harper's been working on, or like with Surprise Stare, it feels like another, or, or Dave Mortimer, like another, Brothers War kind of game, you know, the French Revolution plays under 15 minutes or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, I love ways to subvert things and ponder things more deeply. Yeah, I think I think it's a really, it's just a great way to sort of like break you out of the normal way of thinking about games. Um, and, and it can be really, really creative to, to do that. Um, yeah. I start most of my projects, the other are just puns that get out of hand. Yeah, uh, yes, puns. Um, yeah. Although a game without pieces is fairly common use in languages and hands, or would we consider our words to be pieces? It's an interesting question. I remember, um, so Andrew Sharon of, uh, of Terrible Games, so War on Terror fame, he once wanted to make a game which could be played by people in solitary confinement where you wouldn't you wouldn't have access to anything but yourself essentially but he wanted the game to kind of have use external external stimuli in different ways um and i actually can't he he did end up making a game where you i think you use parts of your body to count things and you were sort of sort of tracking the time and there were ways that you would take input either i think either from like you'd be looking at the position of the sun, or I don't know whether it was your heartbeat or something as like a timer. It was really interesting. And when he said that, it was, it was a bit like also the, um, you know, when uh, Bunshai came up with the, you know, the 18 card game where every card is identical. It's like, the, it was it was a similar kind of thing. Like it had such a clear constraint, but something you felt like that's impossible that I think it's the ones that you think are impossible that are the most kind of, um, the most creative or the most kind of uh, inspiring. Yeah, certainly. The pun first game design is greatly underrated. True, true, indeed, indeed. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, that was board game. Oh, gosh, I keep doing that. Because um, also, Henry, I hadn't looked at Henry's things, and I was sort of wondering whether to like bring something out to what's he got today. Intersecting lines. Players pick two tiles that are not in the same row or column, with one tile showing a sort of a vertical line and the other showing a horizontal line. Extend the lines from the two chosen tiles and take the action of those where those would intersect. Then rotate both of the chosen tiles by 90 degrees and place or place a special tile in the middle of the board. Well, that's kind of interesting. Has a sort of feeling of like like gear. It feels more like very machine like, doesn't it? Sort of like little switches that you're sort of rotating. Um, no, that is actually quite cool. And by definition, you can't, uh, can you take the same action? If they were pointing at each other. Yeah, I guess you would have to, 
like here you you I guess you would probably it would probably be good maybe if you, you actually claimed this tile maybe because I guess the slight problem though is when you rotate like if you chose these two tiles which is taking this tile and then you rotate oh no sorry you won't be able to to get it because this will rotate out and this will hold on yeah you it won't necessarily you won't necessarily have a combination that can point to it um I have to think about that a little bit. I get like the first thing that comes to my mind is how to make sure that you can't just like repeat the same move if you're the same. Like you, you really want like if I take an action, you can't take the next one. Um, but maybe that automatically does that, which is kind of cool. I'd, I'd be tempted to have like whatever actually you claim the tile that you that you've got, um, so that like the board is kind of always evolving, which could be kind of cool. Um, yeah, that's kind of a cool idea. I'd, uh, you'd have to see how it kind of. The other thing I'd sort of say is it feels like a bit too free at the moment. I should say I'm being kind of critical, but only only because I'm trying to think of how how I would approach it. I, you know, let's not say whether the idea is good or not. And um, yeah, like here, the fact that I just wonder how easily could you select any of these tiles. So actually, like here, actually you can't select this. You can't select this. You can select this. You can select that. You can select that. You can select that. You can't select that. And you can't select that. So was that about half or was like three out of eight or something like that? So it'd be interesting to see like how much flexibility there is. Um, and also, I feel like there's like a parity thing. So like parity is that idea of like odds and evens. Um, you see it often in games where, you know, like these two tiles are always two spaces away from each other. Like you can kind of like divide a spaces on a on a checkerboard. Like white and black spaces are different parity, and they they never change, no matter like how you flip them or, or things like that. Um, so it'd be kind of interesting how that might work. Um, that's kind of cool. That's a cool idea actually. And I think you could have a really cool could look really like a machine or something like that, um, which would be cool. Um, there's someone in Facebook was asking about the minimum maximum number of spaces you can have in a worker placement game. It's an interesting place to start pondering things. Could we have a game with only three spaces, only two? What would that look like? Yeah, um, that is a really good good question. I guess the you know there are different ways that you can make make that choice important. Like you could just have one space, but if I had four different workers, then I could choose which worker I'm sending there, and maybe what I get is not only my worker, but it's depending on what, what worker you've sent there. You know, is that is that also yeah a one space worker placement? So it doesn't just have to be the number of spaces. It could be the combination of the thing you send and the place. Maybe that's cheating a little bit because I guess it's not worker. You know, like it's pure worker placement where all the workers have to be the same or, or something like that. Uh, Nicholas say regarding repeating, I agree. It's best to try and do it so that you don't necessarily need a ko rule because that's a ko rule. Like that's like a is that a go reference? I guess where you can't yeah. Because that's a rule less, unless it's light enough that it's not in the way of other things in the game. Yeah, I also agree. Like, if you can get away with not this like repeating rule, but I suspect that it either works. Like, I haven't played, <laughs> I haven't played around with it, but I expect it either naturally works that this rotating or like tweaking how that rotating works that will it will always produce. But it seems like now that it will always produce a different set of um, a different set of options. So uh, yeah, I think that would be good. Um, Manuals. Kanban looks complicated, but it's a worker placement game with a single worker and not too many spaces to place them, but each has a mini game when it activates. Yeah. I find that the same as I say, like Vinos reminds me of that. I mean, it's not also not really a well, it kind of is because you have this central um, grid in, in Vinos, like where you move a worker and it's literally you move the worker and then do the things. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting how it works. Yeah. So. I guess we've moved off from productive creativity, but uh, yeah. But in short, I managed to I managed to get get the thing done, thankfully. Um, and yeah, it's uh, I feel I feel some relief, but now I can tackle the rest of my <laughs> very long to do list, um, which which I have to do things for various designs. Uh, this says, and even if it ends up not being what you want to do, I mean, not a workplace game. It's only important that it's a good game in the end, wherever it is. Blurring the lines can also can only be good. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's the other thing to. It's 
there's not always a right answer because sometimes you can have a vision for a game and that is that is a vision worth st sticking to or like that helps remind you about different choices and directions you're making the game the alter like the kind of flip coin of that which i also agree with is that yeah you should let the game go in the direction it's going to go and you if it wants to go in a different direction don't stop it from being that if, and if it's going to change from what the original constraint or thought was, well, that's great. The, the original thing did the job it needed to do to help you be creative. Um, but it, it, it's, it, it's interesting. I feel like I'm more, slightly more of the games I make now, maybe with a bit of experience, I do know what that vision is from the very start. And I know that that is really integral to the game and that helps me guide it. So it's, I, there are, I feel like there are fewer projects which are like these uh, completely free, um, free paths, free path games where you could, you know, go any direction uh, with design. But it's, it's, it's definitely true. I think it's, it's always worth just following it to its natural conclusion and, and then, um, you know, see, see how you went. Maybe chuckle. Oh, okay. Sorry, missing a, missing a joke somewhere. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Rob, only a small people actually care if something's technically a work placement game. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think actually that's the great, for me, it's, it's always those little ways in which you tweak the way that something normally works, that you push those boundaries. That's where you get the really interesting intersections and new feelings in games, you know, just like, you know, Glasgow and the sort of two player time track thing. There were a little few little tweaks to how the time track thing worked, and that's what gives it the spice. That's what gives it the great feeling and makes it a new game and, and exciting to play. So no, it's, it's, it's really important. Uh, yeah, so I think, I think, I think, I think, I feel myself uh getting to a point where I, I think it might slowly wrap up wrap up the stream for for this evening um so yeah i'll i'll probably stay on for about five more minutes but uh if anyone has question points please throw them in the chat now or for forever hold your peace um if anyone has any ideas what they would like future streams to be about i will also take notes happy to have to take suggestions um i will be planning to um Planning to stream as normal on Friday, I think. Thanks very much, Bess. Thanks for, for coming and staying. And yeah, enjoy your dinner. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'll try and go as close up to Christmas as, as possible. There's like um, Michael Fox is doing some idol con thing. So may, like, which will be some streaming around, I think between Christmas and New Year. So I might try and participate in that a little bit. And uh, yeah, but thanks very much everyone for for dropping by and 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 being so active in the comments and make it really fun. Sorry, I don't always miss. Yeah, you'll have to also, I don't know what is it, do people like that I kind of highlight the comments and just sort of read them out? I feel like it's it's easier to share. Um, otherwise I'm just sort of like um like reading something wordlessly off 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 screen or something like that. Uh, and then everyone can see what what I'm thinking about and talking about. Uh, yes, I will see you tomorrow. <laughs> So, so Theo, you're is it? Are you regularly every Tuesday morning? Is that? I think you're like nine till ten a.m. European time. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. As yeah, it's it. I guess it's easy for me to sort of make sure I don't miss things, but I I will inevitably also miss comments. So um, yeah. But uh, yeah, and well, until Friday. Hope you all have uh, a fantastic, yeah, fantastic week. Uh, whatever whatever's happening in your life. Hope you're safe and well and. And your families are and friends are as well. And uh, yeah, have a have a great have a great week. And I'll see you back on Friday, same time, same place, four p.m. Uh, UK time, five p.m. Uh, European time. Um, if anyone ha isn't following and can follow, I uh, stupidly you can suggest a raid. Actually, you can help me work out how to raid. So hang on the line if anyone's interested in raiding. Uh, do you know someone I should raid? Bez, um, you'll have to tell me, um, but I'm happy to do that. Um, Nicholas, thanks. The micro jam was interesting, and mini reviews were interesting. Yeah, great. No, I, thanks. Thanks very much. I'll, well, I can add them to sort of regular segments um, and and see how that goes. Um, so yeah, Bez, if you have a suggestion for the raid, let me know, and I will happily do that. Uh, Clella Wellen is a, an amazing singer. I just found about. Okay, well let's let's do that. So I guess I have to go into the stream manager right and you go to raid channel oh, and then i yeah okay so how do, is this oh i just type in that will that work into if i'm in stream labs will it still work there's all right well we can just try i guess uh, oh God. no how do i copy that
from StreamYard, you think you need to go to Twitch. OK, OK. I don't know how to copy your comment, though, weirdly enough. Um, hold on. Maybe I can actually just copy it from, from Twitch. Hold on. Oh, da, da, da. I don't know if that will work. Did, did something come up saying that we're raiding? Oh, OK. And then do I just stay on the line and it just sort of works? And it'll, I guess it automatically shuts my stream as well? <laughs> Sorry, everyone that has to like talk me through. <laughs> I can sing part. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. OK. Has it worked? Well, can people still hear me? Where have we gone? Bye, everyone. All right, thanks all. I've sort of frozen on this side, so I hope it's okay. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Yeah, because I've completely frozen on my thing. So hopefully it's still will still move. I don't know how it works with them. Um... Oh, okay, okay, so let's write, okay. 